All right, I think we're going to get started. Um, my name is Liz. I'm from Quasi, and I'd like to welcome you to Quasi Spring 2016 Cyber Seminar Series on the Water Energy Nexus, um, hosted by Bridget Scanlon from University of Texas at Austin. This is the third uh, presentation of the series, and today we have Mark Engel from USGS and Bridget, our host, and they'll be presenting on the water in the oil and gas cycle, including hydraulic fracturing. So Bridget and Mark, take Hi. it away. Okay. Um, this is Bridget um, Scanlon, and um, I, I'm going to talk first, and then Mark will uh, talk um, uh, after me. So um, appreciate you guys um, logging in this afternoon. And uh, as uh, they mentioned, we're going to talk about water in the oil and gas cycle. Uh, so this is the third of a series of four lectures related to water and energy. And um, last week, Barbara Beacons talked about induced seismicity. And uh, the first lecture was by Rick Healy, providing an overview of water and energy issues. And uh, both of these recorded webinars are online. And uh, also, uh, PDFs of the PowerPoint and, uh, are, are also available. And next week, we'll be talking about electricity. Vince Tidwell and I will be talking about water and electricity. Um, so this is the background for the material that I will cover uh, today. Uh, give some background on conventional and unconventional reservoirs and talk about water use for oil and gas production from conventional reservoirs and then for hydraulic fracturing. And then lastly, um, look at the issues of water demand relative to supplies for hydraulic fracturing. So this is a schematic here by Schenk and Palastro uh, showing um, a typical um, con um, unconventional reservoir uh, shown by the shale um, at the bottom. And um, oh, sorry, apologize. I won't bother with this. Um, and uh, then, uh, so in unconventional reservoirs, also termed continuous uh, resources, the oil and natural gas are in the source rock. And uh, the um, shale serves as the source rock, also as the reservoir, and also the trap. And then uh, oil and gas migrates out of the um, source rock and uh, is the trapped. I, I hear an echo. Is, uh, is trapped by stratigraphic or structural traps um, a, for conventional reservoirs. So you can see in this example, a conventional stratigraphic trap on the right and conventional structural trap on the far right uh, showing uh, water at the base of a conventional reservoir oil uh, shown in green in the center and uh, gas shown in orange. So conventional reservoirs also have a distinct water and oil line. So unconventional reservoirs or continuous resources uh, are found in shales and tight formations, low permeability uh, material. And the conventional reservoirs then higher permeability and um, can have just oil or oil and gas uh, with a gas cap. Um, so this is a map of the various shale plays in the US uh, provided by Energy Information Administration. And uh, you can see um, Marcella shale uh, in the east and uh, then the Barnett, which was uh, one of the first shale plays uh, where we had uh, gas uh, production and then the Bakken in uh, North Dakota. Uh, the next diagram is a slightly more simplified version of that um, on a base that shows the basins. So the uh, plays shown in orange are gas plays. Uh, so most of the uh, plays in the eastern and central US are gas plays. Uh, the Marcellus, uh, Haynesville, Barnett, Fayetteville, and Woodford. And uh, most of the oil plays, shale plays, are in the uh, western part of the U.S., including uh, the uh, Permian Basin, Niobrara in Colorado, and the Bakken in North Dakota. Uh, the Eagle Ford is unusual in that it includes uh, oil in the shallow part of the reservoir and uh, dry gas in the deeper portion of the reservoir uh, down dip. So. Um, Production, oil production from uh, shales and tight uh, formations has increased uh, exponentially since about uh, 2010. And uh, you can see that uh, the, the main players are the Eagle Ford in West Texas, uh, the Bakken uh, in North Dakota, and uh, the uh, Permian Basin. Um, so they're the three primary producers. And you can see uh, peaking um, production 
reduction in the uh, in about uh, the end of 2014, and then a reduction recently uh, with a downturn in drilling and exploration and production. And uh, the uh, shale gas uh, production uh, here, uh, you can see, uh, dominated by the uh, Marcellus and uh, then the Haynesville and the Eagle Ford. So Eagle Ford shows up in both the shale oil and shale gas because it produces both. And then others including the Fayetteville, the Barnett, and uh, Woodford. So um, these uh, shales and tide formations account for about 50% of U.S. Uh, crude oil and natural gas production in 2014. So uh, uh, they play a dominant role in oil and gas production in the U.S. So next I'm just going to provide a little background on water use for oil and gas production from conventional reservoirs. So with production from conventional reservoirs, water is used up front during well drilling. And then uh, oil and gas are produced from these reservoirs for some time. And then the reservoir pressure uh, decreases over time. And uh, secondary production or secondary recovery um, uh, is used, including water flooding. And then later again, tertiary recovery techniques are used, including steam, for example, in uh, California, or CO2 uh, in the Permian Basin. Um, and it's important to remember that there's no secondary or tertiary recovery for gas production from conventional reservoirs. Uh, so most of the water use uh, for, conventional, uh, for production from conventional reservoirs is later um, after they have produced a significant amount of oil and gas from the reservoirs um, during water flooding or during a steam uh, injection. In contrast, for unconventional reservoirs, water is used uh, up front for the drilling uh, the well and uh, the long lateral, and then during hydraulic fracturing, which occurs after well drilling. So water is used up front, and then oil and gas are produced with time. And water and propent are injected um, during hydraulic fracturing, and the high pressure of the water uh, creates the fractures in the propent propent maintains the op fractures open so that we can produce oil and gas from these low permeability reservoirs. Um, typical recovery factors uh, from these unconventional reservoirs is the 5 to 10 percent of the resource in place. So it's unclear how much uh, there might be additional water use uh, in the future uh, with any secondary or tertiary recovery techniques that they may develop uh, for uh, unconventional reservoirs. But currently, refracturing uh, is uh, limited uh, to a small number of wells in the different plays. So here I show as an example uh, the uh, data from the Denver unit of the Watson Field in the Permian Basin. And uh, the uh, oil production, oil and water, are shown in million barrels per day. And the oil production is shown by the green line. And you can see initial increase uh, in the uh, 40s uh, through, through the mid-40s, and then a gradual decline over time. And then in the mid-60s, um, they started secondary recovery uh, by flooding, uh, by water flooding. And then you can see an increase in oil production after water flooding with uh, some lag uh, in between. Um, and then after the um, uh, water flooding, then there is uh, an increase in produced water uh, over time. So um, initially, there's not a lot of produced water that could be uh, recycled for water flooding. So initially, another source of water has to be used. And for example, in the Permian Basin, it generally was fresh water from the Ogallala or High Plains Aquifer. Um, in the mid-90s, uh, 75% of the water used for water flooding uh, was um, fresh water, or less than 3,000 milligrams per liter TDS. And this switched to predominantly uh, recycled water over time. And by 2010, uh, only 20% of the water uh, was fresh water. Um, and then uh, with the decline uh, after the water flooding, then the oil production declined again in the 80s. And uh, they uh, injected CO2. And uh, our data stop uh, towards the end of uh, the 90s. So uh, we don't see the increase in oil production related to CO2 injection in this uh, figure. 
but this uh, just shows you that there's well drilling initially and then water flooding after they've been producing for about 20, 25 years and then tertiary recovery in this uh, field is with CO2 uh, injection. So now I would like to compare um, uh, production, oil production from conventional reservoirs with that from unconventional uh, reservoirs uh, using the Bakken as an example. And on the left, I have uh, oil production with, shown by the green line uh, in uh, billion barrels and uh, cumulative oil production from conventional reservoirs in the footprint of the Bakken play. And you can see that it totals after about uh, uh, 60, 65 years, it totals about 1.5 billion barrels of oil. On the right-hand side, I have oil production from uh, the shale um, in the Bakken play. And uh, you can see after about 10 years, we have about 1.3 billion barrels of oil. So we've almost produced the same amount of oil in 10 years with unconventional, uh, from the unconventional reservoir as we produced in about 65 years from conventional reservoirs in this uh, area. And uh, the uh, black line shows the uh, number of wells that were drilled uh, to produce this oil. Uh, initially, I thought we would have a lot more wells drilled um, for unconventional, uh, for production from an unconventional reservoir from the shale because it's a source rock and uh, the oil doesn't move very far. Uh, but actually, we have about 15, over 15,000 wells uh, for producing from the conventional reservoirs uh, over the 65 years and about 10,000 wells for production from the uh, Bakken shale. And that, I presume, is because of the long laterals, which are one to two miles long, and, um, and they access a lot of the reservoir. So even though there's, um, the low permeability doesn't allow the oil to flow very far, the long laterals then make it very effective, and uh, we are producing more oil uh, from less wells in unconventional production. So now I would like to just talk uh, briefly about how much water is used for hydraulic fracturing. And um, there's a number of different data sources out there, and the primary data are generally available through state agencies, such as the uh, Railroad Commission in Texas, the uh, North Dakota Oil and Gas Division, and um, the North Dakota uh, State Water Commission. Uh, Reporting of water use for hydraulic fracturing uh, became mandatory in about 2011-2012 for different states, and Frac Focus uh, has maintained a national database on water use for hydraulic fracturing, uh, and it also includes the chemicals used uh, in hydraulic fracturing. However, it doesn't include uh, data on well completion or oil and gas production, so it's a little difficult then to relate the water used uh, to the uh, oil and gas uh, production. Other um, uh, IHS and Drilling Info mine the state databases and produce uh, national databases on water use and also include well completion data, oil, gas, and water production data. And drill, uh, Digital Water is another uh, group that has uh, recently uh, developed uh, data on water use for hydraulic fracturing, including well completion production data and uh, disposal of uh, produced water. So there are a number of uh, different sources available. So here I show average uh, water use uh, for hydraulic fracturing in million gallons per well for the different plays uh, based on data from a variety of different sources. Monica Freeman study for series in the 2013, JP Nico and some work we did in Eagleford and uh, more recently Kandash and Vengash. Um, and you can see that there's not a lot of variability in the average water use uh, per well. Uh, in the east and, and central area in the gas phase, it's about three to five million gallons per well. And uh, in the um, oil phase, it's um, 0 0.5, 0 0.4 to two million gallons per well. Um, so, um, this, uh, and in the Eagle Ford, it's four to five million gallons per well. When we looked at oil wells and gas wells in the Eagle Ford, where they produce both, uh, we didn't find any uh, difference between the uh, volume of water used for hydraulic fracturing and oil well versus a gas well. 
Um, so there's no inherent difference uh, in those. And I think the low numbers uh, in some of the oil plays, like the Niobrara and the Permian, reflects uh, predominantly uh, in a large number of vertical wells, whereas in other plays they have mostly horizontal wells. Um, there are a number of factors that uh, impact uh, the volume of water used for hydraulic fracturing. And one, as I mentioned, is uh, the number of vertical wells versus horizontal wells. Um, and in the Permian, there's still a lot of vertical wells uh, being drilled uh, in Niobrara, whereas in other places, mostly horizontal. The length of the laterals also affects uh, the uh, volume of water used. Um, geology can also affect it. Uh, for example, when we were comparing water use in the Eagle Ford with that in the Bakken, we couldn't explain it by length of laterals or any other factors, and we attributed it to uh, tight, uh, uh, tight formation in the Bakken in between shales, where most of the production occurred in the middle Bakken relative to shales in the Eagle Ford. Uh, number of frac stages also affects it, and uh, number of frac stages have generally been increasing over time um, from about, for example, one in the Bakken in 2005 to now about an average of about 30. Frac fluid types affects uh, the volume of water use. Slick water generally requires more water uh, than gels. Um, and then uh, there can be differences uh, in water use depending on the operator, with sometimes up to 100 operators in some of these plays. And economics can also play a role when operators on the down cycle now may be evaluating the relative um, uh, impacts of the cost of uh, chemicals for gels versus the cost of water uh, for the slick water type fracks. So a variety of factors can affect it. So in this slide, I just show some of the trends in water use over time using the Bakken as an example. Um, and so we see that um, over the uh, past decade, uh, we have seen an almost tenfold increase in water use per well in the Bakken, uh, which might make you think how, how, val how reliable is an average value, then what does it mean? And then we also saw an increase on the lower left diagram, an increase in the length of the laterals uh, from about um, 5,000 uh, feet to about a, uh, close to 9,000 feet, so almost a doubling of the length of the laterals. So then when we look at the water use per length of lateral, uh, then we still see a large increase in water use, a uh, factor of eight, uh, because some wells have multiple laterals. Um, so other factors may be contributing more slick water uh, fracks um, being used recently uh, relative to uh, more hybrids or gel fracks earlier. So on the lower right, then, I just uh, show the average uh, data and uh, the range in water use within the Bach and play. Uh, you can see that the fifth percentile is, is uh, about 1.6 million gallons per well, and the 95th is 9.2 million gallons per well. So we have a lot more variability in water use within a play than we do between plays when we look at average values uh, across the, the different plays. So the primary purpose of um, hydraulic fracturing is to produce oil and gas. So how much uh, energy are we producing per volume of water? What is the water intensity of the energy production? So here I'm showing an example in the Eagle Ford uh, in the oil zone. Uh, so the average water use per well uh, for hydraulic fracturing is 4.6 million gallons. And the average oil production uh, to date, and this was towards the end of 2013 for this study, was 3 uh, million gallons. So the ratio of water use per hydraulic fraction to oil production was 1.5. So this is one way to represent the water in intensity as in a, uh, a ratio of water used to oil produced. So a lot of people have problems with the units we use. So this is unitless. You can say barrels per barrel or gallons per gallon or liter per liter. Um, so, but these wells should continue to produce over their lifetime. And a value of the estimated ultimate recovery of uh, wells in the Eagle Ford is 13 million gallons in the oil zone. And so with the increased production over time, then if no other water is used, uh, then the uh, uh, water intensity uh, over the lifetime of the well would be about 0.3 uh, million gallons per well in the oil zone. 
So comparing uh, the water intensity of oil production from conventional uh, resources uh, based on a study by Mae Wu at Argonne National Lab, she reported a range from 0.1 to 5. Um, and this is a, a unitless ratio. And uh, the year 5 reflects uh, steam injection in California. 0.1 reflects uh, water recycling and limited use of fresh water in the Permian. So there's a large range. Uh, if we compare the Eagle Ford, the entire plate, then the range based on production to date is 1.4 um, uh, volume of water to volume of oil. And then with um, uh, the lifetime of the well, then it would re re reduce to an average value of 0.4. Uh, for the Bakken, the values are lower, 0.4 to 0.2. And the gas zone uh, in the Eagle Ford, although the volume of water used per well is similar to the oil zone, we're producing more energy uh, from the gas zone, and so the ratios are lower, 0 0.6 to 0 0.2. So uh, with oil production then in the unconventional uh, reservoirs, uh, it's in the lower range of water use for conventional uh, reservoir oil production. So we are using more water in unconventional places because we're producing more oil and not because the water intensity uh, is higher. Um, so lastly, I want to mention then uh, comparing the water demand for hydraulic fracturing relative uh, to water supplies. Um, and uh, Monica Freeman's study in 2013 um, shows uh, the uh, different shale plays in the US and then an indicator of water scarcity uh, with the yellow indicating low stress, less than 10%, and uh, the red indicating high stress, uh, greater than 80%. Uh, so you can see in the eastern US, it's uh, basically uh, low stress conditions in, in most of the regions. And the high stress areas are found in, for example, uh, South Texas or in the Permian Basin area in West Texas and in Colorado. And uh, this uh, analysis was done using the Global Land Data Simulation System model uh, to evaluate water availability, mostly from surface water resources and uh, groundwater uh, recharge from a global model. Um, so this is a good reconnaissance estimate of, uh, for water scarcity analysis. However, uh, water is a local issue, and we need to evaluate the demand relative to the supplies at a more local scale. Uh, so we did an analysis in the Eagle Port, which she indicated was a, a high water stress area. And this is a schematic of uh, oil production from the Eagle Port plate, where the wells are typically average about two miles deep, and the laterals about one mile horizontal. And then you can see the, the aquifers uh, are dipping aquifers in the Gulf Coast region. And as you go down dip, then you get more brackish water. Uh, so the water sources include fresh groundwater. There's very little surface water. Uh, reuse recycling of produced water and brackish groundwater. So we can evaluate those different sources. Um, so initially, uh, they use mostly fresh water. And here we show the impact of the fresh water use on groundwater levels in the uh, play. And uh, these hydrographs show um, uh, the change in water levels with time. And you can see in the west, there are some areas where we've had up to 200 feet of decline in the confined aquifers uh, related to oil and gas production. But then on the one on the lower left, then you can see that it recovered over time. Uh, so some operators required, uh, some landowners require operators to use fresh water uh, with their lease agreements. Um, so there's all, uh, people are always uh, suggesting that we reuse or recycle flow back and produced water. Uh, however, in the Eagle Port, the uh, volume of flow, uh, produced water is very low uh, relative to the volume of water required for hydraulic fracturing. Here we're showing the ratio of produced water to water required for hydraulic fracturing. So in the first couple of months, we're only getting about 4 to 6% of the volume required for hydraulic fraction. So it makes reusing or recycling water uh, very uh, difficult and the logistics uh, almost impossible. Uh, for example, in the Marcellus, they're reusing 90% of their produced water, uh, but that still makes up only 10 to 30% of the water required for hydraulic fracturing. So they still have to get uh, 70 to 90% of the water from another source. So looking at uh, fresh water, uh, uh, the water required for hydraulic fracturing 
actually in the eagle port over the lifespan of the play, which is estimated to be 20 years. So that's 0.3 thousand billion gallons. Uh, and here I show, uh, on the top right, I show different units um, depending on what uh, you prefer. But uh, basically, I'd like you to focus on the size of these uh, droplets. So um, the water use over the 20-year lifespan of the play is, represents uh, a small fraction of the 10,000 uh, billion gallons of fresh water that's in storage in the aquifer. Um, and, that's, uh, and then a uh, small fraction of the 80,000 uh, billion gallons of brackish uh, groundwater uh, that's available in the play. So on a square mile grid scale, we found that the water, projected water demand for hydraulic fraction is less than 2% of the water available. And the projected water demand represents about 10% of the depletions that we've seen in this region from irrigation in the past. So to summarize then, uh, water use for hydraulic fracturing um, uh, is higher uh, than that for conventional gas production because there's no secondary or tertiary recovery in conventional gas production, but is in the low range of that for conventional oil production. Um, and there's some variability among the plays, but there's much more variability uh, within the plays than there is between the plays. And controls on variability in water use are uh, vertical versus horizontal wells, length of laterals, frac stages and frac fluid types. And um, assessing water scarcity, you need to do an in-depth evaluation of water demand relative to supplies at the local scale. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the people that fund the study, the Mitchell Foundation, the Sloan Foundation, Shell, and the Jackson School. And there are references for uh, the material that I presented. So I'm going to hand over to Mark now. Thank you, Bridget. That's a tough act follow, but I'm going to be looking at the other side of the coin, which is the water that comes back out of the wells once they go into production, and that's called produced waters. And so the three topics we're going to hit on today are um, talking about the water volumes from both conventional and continuous hydrocarbon plays, uh, the chemistry and the quality of these waters, and you can see some nice photographs below that my colleague Tanya Gallegos took the last time we were out sampling in the Permian Basin. and uh, that. If you didn't know that oil floated on top of water, uh, it might be hard to tell simply from the color what's the water and what's the oil in these cases. So unusual chemistry. Uh, and then, of course, their management is of a particular concern. People have, given the relatively deleterious composition of the produced waters in a variety of ways, uh, the way they're disposed, reused, or recycled is of interest. So those are the three things we'll shoot through. Um, so produced water is essentially any water that comes out of a hydrocarbon well after it has gone into, after it's been completed. So that can include flowback water, which is mostly the slug of water that comes out right after the well goes into production uh, that primarily consists of the hydraulic fracturing fluid. Um, and then with time, you tend to transition into the formation water that coexists with the hydrocarbons at depth. And then any sort of injected fluid. So water flooding would be a good example. Um, and then lastly, in some cases, you can have water condensing out of the gas phase as it moves up the well bore. So any mixture of those we, we define as produced water. For most wells, uh, we assume that the water that comes out earliest in the uh, play is injected water. Um, so that would be hydraulic fracturing fluid uh, if the wells are fractured, and many are. And then uh, with time, you tend to transition into the formation water. Uh, and the way we know that is simply the easiest way to to determine that is by looking at the um, isotopes. And so uh, this is a time series of oxygen isotope values uh, from three Marcella shale gas wells uh, as a function of time. So we can see the x-axis time is, is a log scale there. Um, so the open symbols on the far left is the composition of the water that was used for hydraulic fracturing. And then uh, we can see uh, how those oxygen isotopes change as a function of time. So even by day one or day two, there's a pretty substantial shift in the oxygen isotopes. Um, and so that tells us that we're mixing the water that we injected with the formation water that's down there. And after about 90 days, we start producing water that is fairly representative of formation water. Let's see. OK. Um, unlike uh, some of these nice databases that uh, Bridget talked about for getting data on water volumes for hydraulic fracturing. There, there are no great places for national scale 
produced water volumes. Um, luckily, there's a couple of reports uh, that we can look to that use consistent uh, methodologies. So Argonne National Labs, Corey Clark and John Vale in 2009 published their estimate for 2007 data, and then John Vale went back and, and came up with a five-year update using 2012 data. And so what they found was, um, even though the amount of hydrocarbons, both oil and gas, increased substantially over that period, the amount of produced water was relatively consistent at 21 billion barrels. And I don't have a great way, you know, I don't have Bridget's mind of being able to look at these huge numbers and, and comprehending about that. But the way I sort of think about it, um, they, they also calculated typical water oil and water gas ratios. And they, they didn't have great data for states, and so I wouldn't pay attention to the trends there. But on average, for every barrel of oil you pull out of the ground, you get maybe five to 10 barrels of water out nationally. And then for natural gas wells, not all natural gas wells produce water. But on average, something like one to 300 barrels of water per million cubic feet. So the take home message is, if oil and gas production increases substantially and produced water volumes do not increase, it tells you that the, the ratio of produced water to hydrocarbons is much lower in the shales and the tight formations. Uh, in terms of distribution of, of where produced waters come by state, again, we're using John Dale's data here. Uh, so these are 2012 data. And there's probably not a, a lot of surprises. So um, you know, Texas, uh, Oklahoma, Kansas, Wyoming, all are large sources of produced waters, although some people might be surprised to see California uh, is the second most a state that produces the second most amount of produced water. And those five states generate more than 75% of all produced waters. And so old oil wells are uh, commonly produce a lot of you know, 10, 20 barrels of water per barrel of oil. So that's partly why California is on that list. Uh, unfortunately, we can't derive really any basin level data. So the Appalachian Basin runs through several states. Uh, or conversely, you could look at a state like Texas, which has the Permian Basin, the Palo Duro Basin, the Fort Worth Basin, and the Gulf Coast Basin, and not know how to divvy up that, that large volume of water. Um, and the, the quality of the data varies by state. Um, uh, as a taxpayer in Texas, I, I can point to Texas and say we do a pretty a cr a crummy job of, of holding on to that data uh, or providing any data. Uh, so John has had to make some pretty huge assumptions about, uh, about those volumes and where they end up. But we can look at states and begin to understand how uh, things change with time and, and how that affects produced water volumes. And so I went to the EIA and I looked at um, monthly gas withdrawals from, for the state of Pennsylvania from 2008 to 2013. And that's what's shown in the black there. Um, so you can see that those monthly withdrawals, which is production, goes up substantially. In fact, it increases by about 1,600% over that five-year period. Um, and then the red line is the proportion of that gas that comes from shale gas. So in the beginning of 2008, only about 4% of all the natural gas from Pennsylvania came from shale gas wells. But by the end of 2013, it was 94%. Um, but the amount of produced water coming from the state only increased by 900%. So that, again, tells us that the amount of water coming from the shale gas wells relative to the volume of gases is relatively small. Uh, I have some even better data out of the Eagleford shale. Um, as Bridget pointed out, uh, the Eagleford is, is unusual in that it produces both oil, shown in the sort of turquoise color there, as well as gas, um, shown in the orange, and it also produces condensate between the two. And I was recently out sampling there. Um, was able to get production data from about 45 wells and calculated, uh, those wells are about three years old, I calculated their lifetime water oil ratios. And that's what that box plot on the right shows. Um, and what you see is that, you know, keeping in mind that nationally, on average, most oil wells produce something like five to 10 barrels of water per oil. Out of the Eagleford, the median value is 0.4 uh, barrels per barrel. So. Uh, again, the, the amount of water being generated out of the new type formations is a lot less. Now, uh, as, as Bridget 
also pointed out there's a there's a complexity to managing this water, uh, both both the needs for going into the wells and coming out because of timing. And different kinds of wells generate their water at different times. And so these are generalized curves that I put together for uh, Rick Healy's uh, USGS circular on water energy nexus, showing uh, essentially when the hydrocarbons and water come out of different kinds of wells at different times. And so uh, a coal bed methane well in the lower left, in that case, you get a ton of water out front because you're trying to dewater the coal bed and lower the hydrostatic pressure so that the natural gas will desorb off the coal. And so you get a huge slug of water out front, and it tails off. Um, if you wanted to manage that water, if you want to take that water and drill another well right away, that water is immediately available. But if you're looking at, say, an oil well in the upper left, it may take a while, a conventional oil well, um, particularly one that you didn't hydraulically fracture, it may take a while for the water to show up in enough quantity that you could actually use it. Um, I'll also point out uh, shale gas wells in the lower right. Most tight formations have really, really steep decline curves. And so you get a slug of water and gas up front, and then it drops off really quickly. Uh, in terms of geochemistry of produced waters, it, there's sort of one takeaway, and that is that produced waters contain absolutely everything. And if you remember that, you're probably pretty well off. Um, they can be very saline. Uh, well, most produced waters, depending on where you are, are generally well in excess of seawater salinity. In terms of trace elements, uh, I'll, I'll show some specifics on that, but er everything's in there. Organics is quite variable uh, in terms of concentration and what compounds are in the produced water, and I'll explain that a little bit as well. Um, na uh, norm, naturally occurring radioactive materials, in particular radium isotopes, um, because they tend to be more soluble constituents in the uranium and the thorium decay chain. You can also end up, of course, with radon code associated with the natural gas. Um, high, you know, produced waters are, are associated uh, with hydrocarbons, and so not surprisingly, there's some oil and grease in them. Obviously, the producers are trying to um, remove that as much as possible, um, just to, you know, that's, that's money being lost. There is some suspended sediment in produced waters, and that can, that can include the profit. And then I, I won't get into it here, but there's been some fascinating work by folks like Denise A. Cobb at the USGS and Kelvin Gregory at Carnegie Mellon about the bacteria and the microbes that are present uh, in the produced waters as well. Uh, this is a map from the, the it's a, this is a product of our uh, project at the USGS, which is the Produced Waters Geochemical Database. And this is a map of, of total dissolved solids in, in produced as well as geothermal springs and things in their uh, samples. And uh, so it's color coded. And, and admittedly, uh, this map is made so we stack the highest TDS on top, um, but just so we can kind of see them a little bit better. Um, but we see that you know, in areas such as the Williston Basin in Montana, North Dakota, the Permian Basin in New Mexico and Texas, and the Appalachian Basin and the Michigan Basins on the East Coast, salinity values can be in excess of, you know, three, four hundred, five hundred uh, grams per liter. And, and we note that bulk seawater has such a low salinity that it barely even registers on our scale over there. So certainly there are areas, particularly in the western United States, where less saline water is found or is comes from hydrocarbon plays, but in general, they're very salty waters. And we can say something about the major ion composition. Um, and so we, we took the produced waters database and estimated on a mass basis um, what's the relative distribution of the anions, which is what you see on the left, and the cations, which is what you see on the right. Um, and so in terms of anions, you'll notice that bicarbonate is missing. And that's simply because most bicarbonate is estimated by alkalinity. And most alkalinity in produced waters doesn't come from bicarbonate. So we don't really trust the data a whole lot. There's also an issue with measuring pH that I won't measure, discuss here. But what you can see is once you get above about 10 grams per liter of salinity, chloride is the only major anion in produced waters. So that's, that's pretty simple. Uh, you can see some sulfate there at earlier portions. But sulfate is generally lost due to sulfate reduction or precipitation of scales, such as barite or gypsum. In terms of the, the cations in the right, lower right, we can see that sodium, the big blue slug, is the most abundant cation in most produced waters. 
Um, but as salinity increases, the relative proportion of calcium, magnesium, strontium, and potassium become important. And there's a variety of geochemical rea uh, reactions that are responsible for that. As I mentioned, uh, in terms of trace elements, um, basically everything's in there. Um, and so this, these are box plots uh, and the, in milligrams per liter. And um, this is, again, a log axis. Um, so that we can put everything from mercury, which is typically, um, even in fresh water, it's the least abundant um, trace element in, in, in most studies. And then you can see sodium, calcium, and chloride on the left. So uh, essentially, um, there's, and there's a lot of interest in, in some of these trace elements uh, as mineral commodities. Um, but we do have to keep in mind that, as I mentioned, the source of the water in produced waters out of a well, any given well, changes over time. The chemistry of that water also changes time. So this is the same three Marcellus shale wells that I showed the oxygen isotopes uh, previously. And so we have TDS in the upper left, sodium in the lower left, chloride in the upper right, and bromide in the lower right. And we can see, uh, again, that's increasing concentrations of all of these as a function of time up until maybe 100, 180 days. And then it gets pretty flat. And so if I can, does that work? I'm not sure if that arrow, there it is. You can see my little arrow pointing there. So the chloride gets pretty flat right there. That's a good, good example of that. Um, so most solutes increase in, in concentration over the first few weeks. And that's primarily due to mixing with the formation brine at depth plus some water rock interaction. There are a couple of things that do tend to decrease over time in concentration. One is sulfate. Um, due to scale precipitation or sulfate reduction, and DOC, organic carbon. And that has to do with the origin of organic carbon in produced waters. And that is, it's a mixture of the natural compounds, which are generally made up of alkynes and, and heterocyclic compounds. You can also get some aromatics, uh, like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And the injected compounds, um, there are a variety of things that are put in uh, for drilling as well as hydraulic fracturing that can um, show up in the produced water. So if it's a slick water frack, it will generally have a friction reducer like a polyacrylamide. Um, biocides are very common. Scale inhibitors, which are typically glycols, will go in as well. And so you can get a big slug of organics that goes in initially and then decreases with time. And the figure on the right-hand side from Bill Oram's paper in, uh, in cold geology um, shows total ion chromatograms from GC mass spec data for extractable hydrocarbons out of a single Marcellus shale well at day one, where I have lots and lots and lots of peaks, and day 243 of production, where the only big peak out there is a single dial. And so you're kind of watching that, that slug of organics uh, dissipate over time. The one sort of uh, funny um, or, or uh, set of compounds that can behave a little differently and can be in very high concentrations in produced waters are the anions of carboxylic acids. And so and this is a plot uh, from Yusuf Karaka's work uh, back in the 80s uh, showing subsurface temperatures, so reservoir temperature, versus concentrations of aliphatic acid ions. So this is C2, which is acetate up to C5 is pentanoate. And so at it, it temperatures less than 80 C, uh, the concentrations of these anions is generally under about 100 milligrams per liter, and it's primarily made of propionate. But from 80 to 100, uh, we see that we can get concentrations in thousands of milligrams per liter. And so in this particular scenario, so I, I just the samples I just pulled from the Eagleford Shale, are about, uh, some of them have acetate concentrations of more than 1,000 milligrams per liter. So in this particular scenario, you can have a lot of organic carbon in the later stage produced water. In terms of how this water is disposed of, obviously, given what I've said about produced waters in general, um, <clears throat> there is concern or interest in how this water is disposed of. And again, there's not great data for this um, on the state-wise, but John Vale's reports uh, do take a, a slug at trying to understand this. Um, so I've got a pie chart that I try to use different symbols. If anyone's colorblind, hopefully this is a little easier to read. Um, and what you see is more than 85% of the water, at least in 2012, was injected either for disposal or enhanced recovery, water flooding. 
they can also put it back in for uh, reservoir pressure management. Uh, that sort of gold color, 3% is surface discharge. And generally, that's for things like cold methane plays, where the salinity of the water is much lower. Um, and at least for his estimates for 2012, there is only 1% beneficial reuse. Um, but we just saw uh, some nice examples from Bridget about how other places that's not really, uh, those numbers are higher. Um, and there's regional variation. So this is a, a report from ESSER et al. that came out for the state of California. And they differentiated between, on the left, uh, pools, hydrocarbon pools that were predominantly hydraulically fractured and those that were not on the right. And, and what you can see is for the hydraulically fractured pools, almost 40% of that water went into unlined evaporation ponds. So again, it really does uh, vary depending on where you're at. Um, there's also issues with how things have changed over time, and particularly in relation to laws. And I think Pennsylvania is an excellent example of that. Um, and Pennsylvania is un unique in that it has very few um, uh, produced water disposal wells. We call those class two UIC wells, because uh, that's the law that controls that. Let's see if I can figure it out. Yep. OK, so you can see a little pointer down here. So you can see very little water from the years of 2008 through 2011, which are what the four sets of bars uh, count for, went to, towards injection wells. Uh, so there's just very few in Pennsylvania. And so there was a period of time, so if I can put my point over here, yep, uh, where, there I got the point figured out, where water was going through uh, municipal wastewater treatment plants. And those plants couldn't treat the water particularly well in terms of the total is all solids. And so they're having problems with the streams that we're going into. And so in 2010, the state said, no, you can't do that. You have to get the affluent from the POTWs less than 250 milligrams per liter, although there were some grandfathered sites. And so we can see a big decrease down to 2010. And that little orange part of this uh, is, is Marcellus shale water. And in, in May of 2011, the state asked all POTWs to stop accepting uh, um, water from Marcella shale gas and Utica shale gas. And that's why the little orange bar goes to zero in 2011. So where did that extra water go? We can see it showed up over here and went into reuse and storage. So in, in Pennsylvania, now much of the produced water from shale gas has gone into um, recycling and reuse. Okay, let me turn that off. Wow. The most high-tech thing I've used in a long time. OK. Um, there was a recent study by Chen and Carter who looked at the frac focus database and tried to determine what proportion of wells being drilled uh, used recycled produced water. And they did that by different states and for the years 2011 to 2014. And so we can see there's a, quite a bit of variability between states. And then you can see things like in, in Wyoming, um, in, in, uh, in, the, in the lower right, Wyoming in 2010 recycled nearly 100 nearly 100% of its frac used recycled water, and that dropped off. And so the good thing about this is that frac formulations over the year have gotten increasingly tolerant, so they can accept more salinity. And uh, slick water fracs are generally more tolerant of what they can accept than a gel frac. And as Bridget said, there people are using more slick water fracs. Um, but there is also a water management and a timing issue. So uh, as we know, there's been less drilling recently. And you can't recycle produced water if you don't have a place to use it, essentially, is the long and the short of that story. Um, so in summary, despite having increased production of hydrocarbons, the amount of produced water generated in the US has been relatively flat. But there is a geographic difference in where that water is coming from. Um, for a given well, the salinity of the produced water, particularly if it was hydraulically fractured, but even if it wasn't, this is true for the drilling fluids, it tends to increase over time, although the, the organics tend to decrease, because many of those are the organics that were introduced for hydraulic fracturing. Um, but in any case, uh, if you have a water, uh, if you have a reservoir at about the right temperature, you can get lots of carboxylic acids. Most produced waters are dominated by sodium, calcium, and chloride. Most of disposed most produced water is disposed of by injection. And disposal methods vary by region and with time. So uh, this is my contact information. And just like Bridget, I have some links for the produced waters database, uh, as well as the references that were cited. So thanks to everybody for sitting through that.
All right, so with that, we'll take questions. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box, and then we'll read them one, uh, read them and answer them one by one. All right, question from Dave Stonestrom. Um, this is for Bridget. When you talk about aquifer water required as percentage of water available, is water available defined as water in storage? Is all water in the aquifer defined as available, or is it available water, some fraction of water in storage? Um, thanks, Dave. Um, yes, uh, so uh, in the Eagle Ford, when we uh, were evaluating uh, water availability, we uh, used uh, water under uh, confined pressure. So we didn't assume that the confined aquifers uh, would become unconfined. We just used the storativity value for the confined aquifer to estimate the water availability. So it's under confined pressure. Any other questions people have? Some people are typing, slowly on those. While we're waiting for people typing, I'd just like to mention, I, I should have mentioned up front that we didn't, I didn't cover water quality issues with hydraulic fracturing, although we recognize that that's an important topic. But with the limited time available, I, I focus mostly on the water quantity aspects. All right, there's a question for Bridget from Carrie Johnson. Do you know if EOR operations were considered conventional or unconventional for the water use estimates you showed? Uh, so the enhanced oil recovery data that I presented uh, was for the production from conventional reservoirs. Um, we did have a comment on, our, uh, on the paper we did on the Eagle Ford uh, saying that it wasn't uh, uh, by um, Dr. Lampert saying that it was not um, um, fair to compare water use by, for hydraulic fracturing with uh, water use uh, for primary, secondary, and tertiary recovery under conventional, from conventional reservoirs. Uh, and we uh, responded to that and looked at the literature to see uh, how much um, refracturing there was and uh, modeling analysis to evaluate whether they anticipated a much increase in water use in the future from these shale plays. So in some cases, for example, in the Bakken, they suggest that they will probably use CO2 rather than water. Um, and the data to date, uh, it, it's not, uh, we can't really determine how much additional water they might use in the future from unconventional reservoirs. All right, do we have any other questions? Oh, Kelsey Hunter, uh, there's a few. Um, Kelsey Hunter, um, have you compared the USGS produced water database with the salinity data available on MatCarb through NEPL? And this is for Mark. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, so I assume you're talking about the NetCarb database that came out about mm, six, eight years ago. Um, we actually started. We included some of the NatCarb database, but regenerated it um, in a sense that we had brought in some of the original publications ourselves, and there were a lot of errors in there. But we also have data from a lot of different sources, and we've tried to fix uh, a lot of errors that were in the NatCarb database, as well as some of our own errors. Um, but we're continuing to grow our, our database over time. So there, there should be some similarities, but generally we'd have more data. And also, we have data for some of the shales, both from our own efforts as well as some of the, our collaborators have been nice enough to send us some of their data as well. All right. Uh, next question is from Alexander Thomas. Are there data sets, maps available describing injection water sources, example sources versus groundwater? Um, yeah, you wrote, sorry, if 
you missed it, but you didn't miss it. <laughs> um, that is. Uh, that is one of the problems we have uh, when we're evaluating water use for hydraulic fracturing is that, for example, in uh, Texas and, um, uh, and many other regions, uh, the, there is very limited or no reporting on the source of water used for hydraulic fracturing. Um, so it's difficult for us to determine whether how much reuse recycling of produced water is occurring. Um, or um, how much fresh water. I, I think in Pennsylvania they do um, report uh, the source of the water and the Susquehanna River Basin Commission and other groups up there. So um, they do link uh, the water use to the water source, but uh, not in Texas or um, some other regions that we've been working with. I mean, in the Eagle Ford, they've been using more, um, you know, brackish water, and some of the uh, agencies, like the groundwater conservation districts, permit up to 20 times more water when the water exceeds 10,000 uh, milligrams per liter TDS, or when it's greater than 10,000 feet. So that's a real incentive for the operators to use the brackish groundwater, and it's uh, under artesian pressure, so they don't have to pump it and reported TDS that they, uh, from the produced water is maybe 20 to 40,000 um, milligrams per liter TDS. All right. It looks like we don't have any more questions. Bridget, Mark, did you want to add anything um, to the presentations or anything after the questions? Um, this is Mark. The only thing I will add is that I, I didn't put in differences between uh, produced water chemistry between shales versus non-shales. There's a little bit of work on that that we've published in the Appalachian Basin and in the Permian Basin, but not a whole lot outside of that. So I didn't want to put any blanket statements in. Uh, no, I have nothing else to add. I just thank people for the, um, uh, logging in. And um, if they have any questions, to feel free to email us. Uh, and we'll have the PowerPoint or the PDF available shortly and the recorded video also, right, Liz? Yep, we'll have the recording up on the Quasi website uh, either today or Monday. And just a heads up for everyone, there is one last cyber seminar in the series uh, next Friday, April 1st at 3 p.m. And it is again with Bridget and uh, Vince Tidwell from Sandia Natural Laboratories. All right, Thanks. if that's it, um, I guess we can end it. <laughs> <laughs> have All a right, good have weekend. a good weekend, everybody.